estrogen. Estrogen is what type of hormone? Lipid. So if it's lipid, what, what does it come from? What compound produces all lipid hormones? Yeah, cholesterol. And if you look at it there, you'll see it says cholesterol right there at the bottom. is producing all those different types right there. Estrogens. Basically all your sex hormones, estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, those are all derived from cholesterol. And that's why I had this big uh, diagram. Cholesterol makes a bunch of these different hormones over there. So that's one of its importance in the body. Let's do number five. That was quick. Number five, good. You guys got it. Thro uh, albumin is going to be our big plasma protein that's going to carry it. So answer E was the answer there. Number six, A for true, B for false. And for 6 through 10, if an answer is false, I want you guys to think of the true answer. I'll we'll ask you that afterwards. Okay, good. So you guys got it's false. So how do we correct this underlined word there? Hormones. Good. Now, uh, another thing. It's hormones because how are they secreted through the body? Yeah, through the bloodstream. They're called neurotransmitters because they'll be secreted through neurons at connections. What are the connections between neurons called? Yeah, synapses. So what do I mean by that? Is because if you look here, you see epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine. You've seen those under neurotransmitters, but now I'm telling you these are hormones. So they're both actually. It just depends where are they secreted in the body. If they're secreted through the bloodstream, then they're called what? Hormones. If they're secreted between neurons, then neurotransmitters. So they can be both. That's what it means when you hear or read that. Just depends how are they traveling through the body. Okay. Let's go back to this here. Number seven. Good. And the answer to why it's slower is because why? It's going through the bloodstream versus through neurons. Does anybody remember how fast neurons can send signals up to around? Yeah, very good. About 300 to 400 miles per hour. They can go very, very fast. Okay. Number eight. Sophia, your press of their answer? Yeah. 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 All mean hormones. Oh, good. Wow. All right. You guys are impressing me now. So, uh, what's the answer then? They have both. Now, to take it one step further, let's go to the chart here. And which one is the only one that has an intracellular receptor? all the way at the top right, thyroxine, T4. That's the only one that's going to have an intracellular receptor, one for inside the cell. So does that mean it's lipid soluble or water soluble? Lipid soluble. So it means it can go through the phospholipid bilayer. Versus the other ones are water soluble, so they can't go through that bilayer. So if we go, and just to show you again how we get to the clip, and this is completely random, but I was up late last night and was wondering what's that. Does anybody know why they put the zipper up there, by the way? What's that? It's it's the birthday of the guy who invented the zipper today. What's that? Did it say when you when I moved it on there? Oh wow! Uh, I guess it's, but it doesn't say that he invented it. No, it says it's his birthday. Yeah, Gideon Sunbacks. I didn't know it was 132nd. But those are the random things I'm doing when I'm not sleeping there. But um, if you go McGraw Hill and type in endocrine. Imagine life without a zipper. Pretty sure everybody here has a zipper. Alright. You have probably buttons is what they used to use. Velcros. Start looking up when everything was invented last night. 
So that's that's how much I just want to get this semester over. Okay. All right, thyroxine. So intra extracellular receptor for this guy here. Intracellular. So I'm not gonna press play on the whole thing, but you guys can watch it. We watched it last time. It says protein carrier. What's this protein right here? Albumin. Right? It's gonna drop it off. It's gonna go through and that it has an intracellular receptor going to DNA. DNA, what do we make off of DNA? And what's that process called? Yeah, transcription and then translation. Okay. Right, let's go back, finish this off here. Let's do number nine. Have intracellular. Good. So the majority of you guys got that as well too. They all they all have intracellular receptors. Okay. Let's do number ten. Okay. Good. All right. You guys studied well. That's really impressive. Right, any questions with this quiz here? Right, just make sure you sign the attendance sheet and power off the remotes. And we will start with extracellular hormones. <coughs> So extracellular cellular receptors, true or false? Uh, let's see, TSH. TSH will have extracellular receptor. True, because there's the H, meaning hormone. And if you see that, you know it's what group? It's peptides. <coughs> So that's how I could ask you like another in-depth question. Other than asking you categories, I'll ask you a name of a specific hormone. How about true or false, epinephrine has extracellular receptor. I'll give you a second if you want to look at that. True. Epinephrine is what category of hormones? Amino acids. Which one of the two amino acids is it coming from? Tyrosine is what you said, right? That tyrosine. Tryptophan melatonin. So tyrosine, uh, yeah, so it's coming off of that. So it's going to have extracellular receptor. So again, what's AA stand for? Amino acid. So it says amino acid derivatives, but not all amino acid derivatives are going to have extracellular receptors. What's the only one that's going to have an intracellular? Thyroxine, T4. So again, these are the publisher's PowerPoints. I'm just trying to highlight some points on here. You want to make sure. So not all amino acid derivative ones, but all of them except thyroxine, T4, which is on the top right of the chart when you look at it. And then all peptide hormones, that is correct. They're not lipid soluble, so they're what soluble? Yeah, water soluble. Uh, so they can't go through the membrane. And then they're going to bind to receptors on the outside of the cell. Okay. So intracellular ones, they can go directly to the inside. They go directly into the nucleus. So these don't go directly, so just uh, two letters to put in here. They have a what effect? They have an indirect effect. So they don't go directly inside, they're going to have something else to go inside for them. So they're going to bind to the outside and something else is going to go inside. That's the clip we're about to see. And, and so there's going to be the first messenger, and I'll just tell you that right here. I should have asked you about the second. But the first messenger, that's the hormone. And so there's going to be two messengers because, again, we want to get to the inside. The inside, we have the DNA, we're in the nucleus. We want to get to that spot. Intracellular, they can go right through the membrane. Extra, okay, we're stuck on the outside, so we're going to need something else, a second messenger, and it can activate or inhibit things on the inside. So that second messenger, I want you to pay attention when you watch this clip, is going to be derived from ATP. Again, 
pay attention. What's the first messenger again? The hormones. So in this case, epinephrine. So you're going to see a series of events on here, and then you're going to see a second messenger pop up there. So just, uh, just pay attention, so then we'll talk about it after. Epinephrine is one of many hormones that is water-soluble, hydrophilic, and therefore unable to cross the hydrophobic plasma membranes of its target cells. Instead, it binds to receptor proteins located in the plasma membrane and does not enter the cell. When epinephrine binds to beta adrenergic receptors on the liver cell, G proteins on the inner side of the cell membrane are activated. Each G protein is composed of three subunits, and the binding of epinephrine to its receptor protein causes one of the G protein subunits to dissociate from the other two. The G protein subunit, which dissociates from the others, carries a GDP, which is replaced by GTP when the subunit is activated. The activated G protein subunit then diffuses within the plasma membrane until it encounters a cyclase, a membrane enzyme that is inactive until it interacts with the G protein subunit. When activated by the G protein subunit, a cyclase catalyzes the formation of CAMP from ATP. The CAMP formed at the inner surface of the membrane diffuses within the cytoplasm where it binds to and activates protein kinase A, an enzyme that adds phosphate groups to specific cellular proteins. In liver cells, protein kinase A phosphorylates and thereby activates another enzyme called phosphorylase, which converts glycogen into glucose 6-phosphate. The glucose 6-phosphate is then converted to glucose. Through this multi-step mechanism, epinephrine causes the liver to secrete glucose into the blood during the fight or flight reaction. As so you can see it moving out there. So again, what's the big overview over here? Epinephrine. What's another name for epinephrine? All right, it sounds like you guys need it. What's what does adrenaline do? It gives energy. Right, I need it too. But it's going to give energy. So you need sugar. So epinephrine is coming here to do sugar, but it's not that simple. There's a lot of things that's got to happen here. Epinephrine is not lipid soluble. It's what's soluble? Water. So it's got to stay out in the water environment. It can't go through the lipid area. So it's going to bind here. And then a series of events are going to happen. And then it's going to create a second messenger. What was the second messenger in there? Before the G protein? Actually, after the G protein? ATP change into what? Yeah, into CAMP, all right? C A M P. ATP, adenosine, and how many phosphates in there? Three. Triphosphate becomes cyclic, it becomes circular structure. And how many phosphates in there? Yeah. You got that from mono, right? So it becomes a cyclic structure with one phosphate. So this is the enzyme, it's called, uh, I can't even say it, adenyl, there we go, adenyl cyclase. It's just it's going to take the A, which is adenosine, from ATP, and it's going to make it circular, uh, whatever, make it in a circle. So that's this point, though, is it's going to take the message now inside. Because, again, I don't want you guys to get lost in all this big detail. I'm not going to get into it for your test. I want you to get the, the overview here. Is that intracellular, okay, if you go right through, why could we go right through with intracellular receptors? because they're lipid soluble. This can't go through. So the first messenger is here, and then we're going to have a bunch of second messengers, which is going to be cyclic A and P to go inside the cell. So we go back here to the PowerPoint. That's just a picture. I'm skipping over it because I showed you the clip. But cyclic A and P is going to be the second messenger. So how does it tie in now if you're thinking about a test question? Is I could say uh, true or false. Let me pick another one here. True or false dopamine would cause um, the, I don't know if I say release or secretion, or dopamine would involve cyclic A and P, something like that. True, because dopamine is what class of hormones? It's coming from tyrosine, which means it's extracellular, which means it's water soluble, which means it's going to you know, involve that. So. Again, what am I doing here is now you're starting to add another bridge to that. What we did simply is we just, in this quiz, is we said, 
It's protein, so it's, it's extracellular. Now we take specific ones, or specific amino acids, and you're just going to step back. So that's, again, what are you doing is you're looking at that chart. So you go back and you look at your chart here, and, for example, amino acids, and you say, okay, epinephrine or dopamine, that's coming from tyrosine. Tyrosine is an amino acid. Right? These here, we said they're going to be intra or extracellular receptors over here. Extra. The only one that was intra was thyroxine. So if it's intracellular, um, so if it's extracellular receptors, epi, nor epi, and that, that means we're going to need something to take it to the inside, which means we're going to involve the creation of uh, cyclic AMP. So, yes. You go, go to Google and just write McGraw Hill uh, endocrine, and it'll be the first results that pop up. And just click on the side of it. So that's going to increase cyclic AMP uh, within this cell. So I've heard also G protein mentioned. That's just another portion that's important that I want you guys to know about that. Again, I'm not going to ask you, you know, to list a series of um, steps necessarily of all these other parts, like you saw phosphorylase and you saw this other cyclase and all that. You don't have to worry about all that. That's just extra detail. But the main thing is there is this big complex here. It's called the uh, G protein complex. And that's the link between the first and the second messenger is all these proteins here. You'll see them uh, highlighted in brackets. Uh, it should. Maybe a little bit back right there. Okay. So the G protein, that's just this huge complex. So everybody usually, when you study it, remember it's like a G or some big gang. It's just a bunch of proteins or something like that. But it's going to go from here to there. And again, don't worry about all these um, specific steps, but the first messenger will be the hormone. Then we're going to bind the G protein. The G protein is going to create what second messenger next? It's going to use ATP to make, yes, CAMP, cyclic AMP. Right? So that, that's the parts that I want you guys to uh, focus on. You don't have to worry about all this other uh, glycogen and glucose 6 and all that stuff. That's just extra. So what's the benefit to all of that is something called amplification. Why, why would you put an amp in your car? Yeah, so it'd be cool and roll up, right? And you got some nice loud music. So that's the same exact idea here is uh, when we go back here, there's amplification by doing this is if this was intracellular, it was just going to go straight in, and it's like a domino, one by one by one. We go straight into the nucleus, one after the other. But because of this, this uh, first messenger, this one of them, can create several second messengers. It's like one domino hits two dominoes, and each of those hits two more, and then two more, etc. So you amplify that signal. For example, if we want epinephrine, which is this right here, we need energy. So what did you notice was secreted at the end of this whole thing into the bloodstream for energy? Yeah, we want glucose to be secreted out into the body. So you need a big rush of energy. So once that hormone hits, you want to try to cause a lot of glucose as you can to get there. You don't want to wait for more epinephrine to get there. You want that one to give you as, many, as much glucose as you can. So this has a benefit of having amplification so it can keep converting uh, ATP inside to cyclic AMP. So right here, this one protein converts one, two, it can keep going, just because of just that one first messenger. So that's what amplification is. It can lead to thousands of second messengers from just a small amount of first messengers. <coughs> How does it shut off? Well, this part here, there, this will drop out. There's a, uh, right, so GDP, once you get GTP in there, this is the same triphosphate, but instead of A from ATP, if you remember uh, the bases of DNA, adenine, guanine, A, G, C, T, U, all that, yeah, they, this one, instead of adenine, it's guanine. So what happens is guanine will go in here, triphosphate, and then uh, there's usually different signals like negative feedback in the body, and it comes back down, or this will break down from GTP to GDP, meaning it lost the phosphate from tri to diphosphate, and then it will go backwards like that.
So it's really not going to do with the four lines you need for the second shift? It kind of has like three types of things. There's one with the hormone leaving. That's one of them. Another one is the amount of energy, because GTP is an energy molecule. So how much of it you have left inside there and how fast it can be replenished. Another one is uh, glucose, measuring how much glucose is in the body. It will be like a negative uh, feedback and will come back and shut that off. So there's kind of like yeah, three different levels of response that will go to turn it off. But the main thing that's going to happen is GTP will be broken down to GDP. It will lose a phosphate and go back to the... All right. So here's kind of uh, another idea tying into this a little bit here. Down regulation and up regulation. And if I was going to make this PowerPoint slide, I would reverse each of the two bullets in each category. So I would reverse these here, and I would do the same thing up there. Because, for example, it says when levels of a, a hormone are high, so if you have a lot of a hormone in the bloodstream, it's going to uh, decrease the number of receptors. So what does that mean? Well, if we, let's talk about uh, positive and negative feedback. Heart rate, if we go running, what's gonna happen to heart rate? It's gonna increase. But what does our body wanna do in response to that? It wants to try to decrease it because we're trying to reach a balance. What's a balance? Homeostasis. So it's going to try to do that. Similar but different example. If we're laying down, what's going to happen to heart rate? It's going to slow down. It's going to decrease. Our body's going to do what? Yeah, try to bring it up or increase it. Is that an example? Both of those. Are those an example of negative or positive feedback? They're both an example of negative feedback. Negative doesn't mean direction. I mean, in a sense, it does. What I'm saying is some people think negative means if one goes up, the negative is down. And then think, they think positive, if something goes down, it's going to bring it up. Negative just means the opposite direction. So if something's going up, it's going to bring it down. If it's down, it's going to bring it up. To contrast that with positive, what's an example of positive feedback in the body? Childbirth involving what hormone? Because you're going to see that today too. Oxytocin. How does it help with childbirth? What does it do? Increases what? It, it does, actually oxytocin does have uh, bonding as well too, but for, for the uterus, it's going to do what to the uterus? Yeah, it's going to have contractions. So um, it's going to, yeah, do contractions. So if oxytocin is released into the uterus, then there's going to start contractions. As the body senses that, uh, does the body going to increase or decrease it? to aid with delivery of the baby. It's going to increase it, so that's positive. So it started going up, the body's going to keep going up. So that's positive feedback. It's the same direction. It doesn't mean we go down then up. It continues the same way. So this is a similar, like slightly different idea. Let's say you have a lot of something in the bloodstream, like a lot of hormones, which is what this is saying right here. So if you have a lot of hormones traveling through the bloodstream, okay, one thing is you want to think you want to uh, decrease the hormones, but there's another thing you can do. It's in revolving the receptors. What do you notice happens to the receptor amount if you have a lot of hormones in the bloodstream? It's going to go down. So again, what's happening here, if we take epinephrine for example, and let's say there's a lot of epinephrine, a lot of these red dots out here in the bloodstream. The receptors, nothing's going to happen unless there's a receptor for it on the cell. Remember, that's the idea, we need a receptor for a target cell. So if there's a lot of receptors, then the cell is going to respond to all that hormone in the blood, but we don't want it to. So if we can't decrease the number of hormones, what are we going to decrease then on the cell? Receptors. Let's do the opposite example now. Let's say that there's very few hormones in the blood, but we still need to, we still need to maintain some homeostasis. We can't increase the number of hormones, so what do we do to the number of receptors? We're going to increase it. So that's what down regulation, up regulation has to do with it. This ties into, and I might use this as an extra credit for you know, for diabetes. Diabetes mellitus, because there's insipidus and there's mellitus. Diabetes mellitus, and there's two types. This would be diabetes mellitus type 2. This is the one that usually happens from uh, overeating. It's not genetic. It's just you develop as you age. And uh, the thing about that is somebody's, let's say, eating a lot. You eat carbs, what do carbs break down to? 
break down to sugar. So now you have all the sugar traveling through your bloodstream. What does your pancreas normally want to secrete to decrease insulin? So it wants to secrete insulin. Insulin is going to put receptors, these purple things, on the cell membrane so that it can remove the glucose from the blood and into your cells, like your adipocytes. What are the adipocytes? Fat cells, your liver, and your muscles. So, but what's happening is you are eating so much carbs and sugar that there's so much glucose in there and that finally the receptors are saying, you know, there's so much insulin now that we're, is in the body and we can't, you know, we keep secreting insulin, but we can't keep up with all the sugar that you're intaking. So we just say, it's just like we're working overtime. We're not going to work anymore. So they down-regulate, which means they just basically get sucked down back into the cell. So then you end up with all that glucose in the blood. So even if a uh, type 2 patient takes insulin, it doesn't matter. Because your body's still secreting it, but there's no what for it on the cell. There's no receptor, so it gets down-regulated. So that's the difference with type 2 versus type 1. Type 1 is an autoimmune. It's a, destroying the insulin-producing cells of the pancreas. So that one's genetic. But anyways, I'll leave that as an extra credit for you guys, most likely. Uh, any questions, though, with that there? OK. Now, this is just a review. I guess they put it in here, and I just tried to delete some things just so you can review it. Intracellular receptors are on what side of the plasma membrane? Yeah, on the inside. Uh, yeah, believe it or not, there's people who miss that. Includes uh, what type of, what group, what category? Lipids, right? Intracellular lipids because we go through the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. That's the whole idea of how you go in and how you go out is that plasma membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. To go through lipid, you have to be a lipid component. So it doesn't just include that. Steroids are just an example of lipids. Uh, it also includes part of which category of hormones? There's three, there's three groups. Amines. There's only one amine that's intracellular as well. Thyroxine. T, what number? Four. So you'll, you'll know this now when we get to thyroid hormones and we start doing that in depth, most likely next class you'll know thyroxine is T4. And then alter uh, DNA transcription and all that. Again, just to remind you, just go back here, and if you watch on the clip, we have thyroxine. So there, there's the T4. What's that protein is going to be bound to? Albumin. So the next thing here that we're doing as a review is to go through the three steps of intracellular receptors. So I just want you guys to write them out. Nothing new here. It's just a review. So I'm going to step through on the video, and you guys can uh, start to fill this in here. So the first thing is you're going to have your hormone go, what, inside or on the surface of the plasma membrane? Yeah, so the first step, number one, is the hormone is going to go inside through the plasma membrane. Yeah, diffuse through. You could use that term as well, too. So again, we're doing the steps of intracellular receptors now, because you've seen it a couple of times, so I want you guys to you know, start to write it out and have it in your mind. So the first thing is it's going to go diffuse through the plasma membrane. It's not going to be on the surface. If it was on the surface, what category would it be? It would be what soluble? It would be water soluble. But it's liquid soluble, so it goes through. Step two, if you look at this clip, what do you notice is the next thing that's going to, well, not this, hold on. Uh, step two, this part right here, binding to, yeah, what type of receptor? Intra-extra. Yeah, it's going to bind to an intracellular receptor. So again, step two, the hormone is going to bind to an intracellular receptor. And it makes sense. If it's intracellular, it's going to bind to an intracellular receptor. Yeah, so that part there I won't get uh, too technical about because the thyroxine does go inside the nucleus. The other hormones, if uh, I show you the other steroid hormones, this clip here, they actually don't go inside the nucleus. These have their receptor outside the nucleus, but they're both lipid soluble. So it's just a different level of technical detail I won't worry about. And then the third step 
is where we're going to call this the protein receptor complex. Where is it going next? Yeah, so the protein receptor complex, step three, goes to the DNA and is going to alter the rate of what? What process? DNA to RNA, transcription. Right, so again, the st step three is the protein and hormone complex is going to go to the DNA and alter the rate of transcription. And of course, everything after that, but uh, you won't worry about the rest of it. But what's the process after that, like RNA to protein translation? So don't confuse those two there. Any questions on those steps? So obviously I had, had you write them out, so make sure you understand them. There's pictures that break it down into multiple different steps, but those are the three that I wanted you guys to know. Okay. Reflexes. Pretty similar to nervous system. You guys did pretty well. You did very well with nervous system. There's five packets and you did very well, so you should get this. Reflexes, we have different types of reflexes. If you remember, there was monosynaptic and there was polysynaptic. Mono, again, meant how many synapses? One, so we involved two neurons in that. Polysynaptic, poly meant how many? Many, so this is the same idea, except we're not talking about the number of synapses, we're gonna be talking about the number of hormones coming up here. So, but first, just reflexes in general. Reflexes in general, while well, there's negative feedback, is the majority of them, but some of them, don't just involve negative feedback, they also involve what? The opposite of that? Good, positive feedback. But the majority of them, you know, I want to point that out, are gonna be negative feedback. For example, if there's a lot of insulin secreted, the body's gonna do, wanna do what to that amount of insulin? It's gonna wanna decrease it. Of course, after it does its job, but it doesn't want it to keep going, or else you're gonna end up, what, glycemic, if you have a lot of insulin? A lot of insulin is good. Insulin does what to blood glucose? Insulin decreases it. That's why diabetics will take insulin because you eat a meal, it breaks down the carbs to sugars. When you eat that meal, it does what to your blood glucose levels? It increases it. So you take insulin if you can't produce it on your own, and that acts to decrease it. So if there's a lot of insulin, that's going to decrease it so much, you're going to become, again, what glycemic? Like poglycemic. So you don't always want that hormone to be secreted. So you want it to go back down. So that's a type of negative feedback. The same with the majority of your hormones, your thyroid hormones as well too. There are some which are positive feedback. For example, LH. LH is luteinizing hormone. That's the one that causes ovulation. So hopefully we'll have a time to do the reproductive physiology and then we'll talk about uh, that positive feedback mechanism. This slide you can just cross off. Got a nice big X on there for you guys. I'm sure you wish you saw more of those on more slides. But this is the part where I was talking about number, when the next slide after that, where they're simple and complex. That's the same as mono versus polysynaptic reflexes. Simple is going to involve one hormone. So it's saying one hormone is secreted and it shuts off that hormone. Complex is where we're going to get into the hypothalamus and the pituitary. And that's going to pretty much be the beginning of our next class where I'll start to draw things out for you guys and break this packet down into more detail. So next one, uh, next class will be very important in terms of understanding like different levels. I'm gonna, it's not in your packet, but I have my own way that usually helps to put things into like level one, level two, level three. And that idea just rotates onto a lot of things. So there's simple and there's complex, just talking about the number of hormones involved in that reflex. Good. So now we're getting in a little bit into the hypothalamus and then what's this gland that hangs down beneath the hypothalamus? The pituitary. So the pituitary and the hypothalamus have a connection. But there's a front half to the pituitary. What's the word for towards the front interior? So the other half is going to be what? Posterior. The posterior. The, um, the pituitary also has an intermediate layer, which we won't really get into, but the main parts are the anterior and the posterior. So if you look up there, the hypothalamus has a connection with what part that we're talking about here? Posterior. So don't, don't miss that point right there. This is the connection with the posterior. 
Now the hypothalamus does connect to the anterior as well. But the part that connects to the posterior, we call it the neuroendocrine reflex. Neuro, what do you think you're looking for? You're looking for nerves. Endocrine, well, it's because the pituitary gland is a large endocrine gland. So up here, the hypothalamus, well, if we zoom out so you can see a little bit, here's the brain, here's a box, there's what's above the thalamus. We take out hypo, right? maybe the thalamus, and below that is the hypothalamus. So we're zooming in on that. So there's the hypothalamus, and in green, those are the nerves. So the connection, and I'll tell you the connection of the anterior part next, but first the posterior part. So the posterior part is connected through nerves, from hypothalamus to posterior. So that's called the neuroendocrine reflex, something that we're going to talk about more at the beginning of next class. Now, uh, I'm going to jump categories here. And again, this is how the publisher arranged them. I'm going to jump down to here, so page 14, if you guys go there. We're not going to finish it all, but we're just going to briefly get into it. Again, page 14. Pituitary gland. Well, you guys probably already saw it. But uh, what's that horse saddle that the pituitary sits in? Yeah, cella turcica. Okay, so the pituitary sits in the cella turcica, the horse's saddle, or the Turkish saddle to be more proper and it's going to hang uh, b beneath the hypothalamus and I forgot to highlight this as well too the infundibulum excuse me that's uh, they call it like the stalk or what it hangs down from let me show you the picture so there's the hypothalamus here's the pituitary it has an anterior it has a posterior it does have an intermediate, this depends what book, sometimes they consider all part of the anterior. And this connection right here is the infundibulum. Although it's pointing at this here, it's talking about the whole piece that's hanging down, the pink part and uh, the lighter uh, beige part as well too. So that whole part is the infundibulum, which is the connection between the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. So make sure you have that down as well too. Now, here's where we start to get into a bunch of the hormones. So there's two halves. There's the anterior, there's a the posterior. I'll give you a way to remember this as well, too. So if FSH, follicle-stimulating hormone, and luteinizing hormone, those are the re reproductive hormones. So again, hopefully it'll be another time at the end of this unit we'll talk about those. ACTH, adrenal corticotropic hormone. What gland does that sound it's going to? Adrenal gland on top of what? The kidneys, what part of the kidney? Oh, sorry, what part of the adrenal gland? Part of the cortex. Is that the outer or the inner? The outer region. And so adrenal corticotropic hormone. We'll get to that again later on. I'm giving you a little intro now to these hormones. TSH, what's the T for? Thyroid. Good, stimulating hormone. Prolactin, uh, milk secretion for uh, the baby, and then GH is what? Growth hormone. All of those hormones are what class of hormones? Very good. Peptides. And again, what cued you guys off? You can see the H abbreviation and all of that. So even prolactin, that's a peptide hormone as well, too. Posterior, you have oxytocin uh, dealing with uh, labor, or the uterine contractions. And then vasopressin, ADH, what's ADH? Uh, Antidiuretic hormone. I'll ask you a hard question right away and then we'll back it up if you need to think about it. ADH, is that going to increase or decrease urination? There's a class of drugs people take to urinate more. They take diuretics. So antidiuretic. It's going to decrease urination. But then what is it going to do to the blood pressure? It's going to increase it. Because the water is not going to go out. Right? You're not going to piss it out. You're going to keep it in your bloodstream. Right? Did you guys see the relation there? No? Just stuck on the word piss? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
It's because of retaining fluids, so they take diuretics. But basically what's happened is either going to urinate the water, okay, sounds better. So you're going to urinate the water, or you're going to retain it in your blood vessels. So if you keep it in your blood vessels, you have a lot of water in a pipe. So if you have a lot of water in a pipe, what happens is the pressure increase or decrease is going to increase. So antidiuretic actually increases blood pressure. So that's why people take diuretics such as Lasix, um, thiazides, or anything like that, because it's going to increase urination, which means they're going to decrease blood pressure. So also known as vasopressin, vasopressin. But the way to remember these, again, you have open books, so you can just look at it right away. But if not, the acronym everybody uses in school is you take the first letters, uh, flat, and then you need the I from this, flat pig, which is uh, what people remember the anterior pituitary hormones with. Uh, but you can confuse that, because what letter would you confuse if you use those letters? Which hormone between anterior pituitary and posterior would, would you yeah, ACTH and ADH, because they both begin with A. But I just remember that uh, there's more up here, so it has more letters in it. This one has fewer hormones, so it's a fewer letter abbreviation. But again, you have your notes, so you should be fine, I'd hope. All right, so, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to say that. But, um, so the connection between, I'm doing this because I want you guys to do well. All right, so uh, the connection between the hypothalamus and the posterior pituitary, what's connecting them that we just saw a couple slides ago? Mm -hmm. The nerves. The infundibulum would be connecting both of them, would be the whole stop coming down. Yeah. So the hypothalamus to the posterior pituitary, that's going to be the nerves. So that's the neuroendocrine system. Here's the connection to the anterior. What do you notice the connection is? If they're saying vessels, then what are they saying is going down there? Yeah, blood, basically. So the connection between the anterior and the hypothalamus is going to be your blood vessels. So we call them here your portal vessels. The connection between the hypothalamus and the posterior, again, are what you see in green, is going to be nerves. So make sure you, you know that there's a difference of the connections between the anterior and the posterior. But again, what's the whole big stop that hangs down and connects both of them here? Yeah, it's a little tough for us, right? right. Infundibulum. Okay. So next time what I'm going to do is I'm going to break them down. It's like level one, level two, level three. For example, level one, what do we notice? Where in the brain are we starting up at? Hypothalamus. Then we're going to go down to, what's this structure here? Pituitary, so that's going to be level two. And then level three is going to be our target organs or our target glands. For example, what are our target organs and glands in the endocrine system? Just random examples. Thyroid, pancreas, okay. adrenal glands. Yeah. So those will be our level three, depending on what we're talking about. So we'll say, for example, something secreted from level one. Level one secretes to two, two goes to three. And the idea is going to repeat. So that's something that's not in the packet. So this, um, to help it make it easier for you guys, make sure you're here for that next time. Any questions? All right. So we ended a few minutes early. If you have questions, you come ask me. Grades, whatnot, just let me know. Power off the remotes. And uh, there was something else too. Attendance. If you didn't sign it, make sure you sign it.